I'm John McLoon from the Technical Communication and Strategy Group. My talk is going to be about uh, Mathematica 10 and I'm going to try and outline a whole collection of new features from new data processing, the image processing, new deployment platforms and its integration with the cloud. Okay, so uh, continuing straight on then, um, uh, I will keep the stage. Uh, it's my job, my great pleasure, to introduce uh, our next release, it's that time of year again, uh, that we're building up to the release of Mathematica 10. And uh, there's an awful lot to talk about, and unfortunately not very much time, because in Mathematica 10 there are about 1,000 new features. So with 30 minutes, I'm going to just take a whistle-stop tour around uh, what I think are perhaps the most interesting hundred of those. And uh, it, I think even throughout all of the talks here, we're not going to be showing uh, everything that's, uh, that's in Mathematica 10. It'll, you'll have to wait your turn to get your hands on it and explore it for yourself for all of the great detail. So in that set of new functionality, there are some completely new domains that we haven't tackled in the past. And pretty much every domain that we do cover has had improvements or additional functionality added to it. There's new Mathematica deployments, which, uh, since I'm on the, almost the latest build, might work for me when I try and show them in a few minutes that didn't work for Conrad. Uh, and despite all of that, we continue our efforts to make Mathematica easier to use than ever. And so despite the extra functionality, I think you'll find it easier to use than previous versions, even though there's now more to, to know and more to learn. So it's very hard to try and pick uh, what's a headline feature. Um, I picked this out just because, to me, it seems like an important direction and, uh, and it's kind of interesting the, the way that some of these things have been implemented. We've got a major new focus on data science, and I think this also draws together some of the other uh, domains, because as Conrad said, one of our things is always to be as integrated as possible. So part of that is to have efficient database-like operations, that we've always been in this realm of bringing a chunk of data that's nicely structured and do something with it and then spit it back out. And we want to do the structuring as well, so that more of the workflow can live within Mathematica. Uh, you'll see these blobs all the way through my talk. This is just to point out where you will hear more on this topic. So there's a big data talk at 2 p.m. on Wednesday where you'll find out about this feature in great detail. Uh, and I haven't initialized my notebook, so this will take a second. So here is a blob of data. Uh, in the new mathematical language, it's a data set. And it, uh, it's very kind of column-oriented. We've got uh, various uh, dates, and this is maybe sales revenue data from some company. But one of the key things that we've done is made it so that you can interrogate this without having to know much about its structure. So, for example, I can take the first five rows out in the same way that we've always done, taking the parts, but I can name things by, by column name. So here I'm getting the first five complaints out of uh, this column. I don't need to know that that was column four, and if it changes later, it doesn't matter that it's no longer column four. I now be able to reference things by name. And by having this data set uh, wrapper, we can also uh, pass symbolic arguments in that can do all kinds of slicing and dicing and rearranging. So, for example, I'm going to select all of the records in that database where there's been but more than five complaints, and I want to see the number of units shipped and the complaints for that, uh, that set. So we've, we can slice it down. We can aggregate the data. I could just say, well, I just want to see how many complaints there were in total. Or I could operate directly on it with things like computation and visualization. So here's a quick plot of uh, revenue uh, per unit over the time series that I have. You know, see this new uh, named pure function slot argument uh, is part of rounding out the language syntax. Now, another thing that comes up quite often is you have multiple data sets. So here's I've got some cost data that maybe has come out of a different database, and I want to do stuff that rel relates to both of these. Well, they have something in common, and quite often with relational databases, they're related by something. Here, they both have dates. And so it's now trivial for me to join these two data sets together, saying wherever the dates are the same, join those records together. Now, you could do this in Mathematica before with, uh, with select and cases and, and uh, maybe a loop running through the data. This is much more convenient, as you can see, but it's also much more efficient. So we're doing fast operations as well as easy operations. Um, and now I've got that combined data. I can start doing things like uh, plotting one data against another uh, where they have that date in common. Another thing you can do is to rearrange data. So I'm going to do group by here. I'm going to take all of that information, and I'm going to group together all of the things that are in the same year. So I'm just going to take the date value of the date and just look at the year part of it. So I'm aggregating all of these different month data into single records, and I'm merging them by adding them together. So now I've got the revenue by year. Again, I could do it before, but now it's a one-liner and much, much faster and less intensive on memory. 
And like everything we do, the underlying structure is symbolic, so we can have any kind of content in this data, numbers, text, images, uh, programs, interactive things, whatever you want uh, can sit inside this structure. Okay, so we can do stuff with data that uh, is kind of old-fashioned in a sense for, for us, but, uh, but sort of a nice smooth workflow. We actually want to be able to do new things with the data. So another major direction on the data science is a machine learning framework. And uh, you can see this uh, later on today. So here's a different uh, set of data that I've got. Uh, and this is imagined to be uh, products that were sold by a, a finance retailer. So we know something about the customers, how much they earn and what they do. And, um, and what their education is, and then what product they bought. So the question is, can I rearrange that data so that I can get out the data by the product they bought, and then learn something about the kinds of people who are day traders versus long-term investors? Well, for that, we have this high-level function, classify, which is going to build a classifier using machine learning against that data. And again, like everything we do in mathematics, we try and automate as much as possible. So in this case, it's decided that the method is naive Bayes. It could have been uh, one of half a dozen different methods. But I don't care about any of those details unless I'm some kind of expert and I can specify that. It's figured out that that's the best way to classify this. And having built that classifier, we can now give it some data it's never seen and ask it to make a prediction about what this person will be interested in. And it doesn't matter if some of that data was missing uh, we've only got a partial data on this customer. It still manages to make a recommendation. And of course, there's all kinds of details if I want to drill into this. So there's how it breaks down that it thinks it's 60% likely that they're a medium-term investor from this. And again, all kinds of data can be put into the, the, the classifiers. Um, we have shipped with a few built-in classifiers uh, that work on, for example, strings. I can give it some string to classify, like I love talking about computers. And it'll figure out that that's probably a Facebook uh, topic of technology and that there's a positive sentiment and it's not spam or, or, or profane. So Conrad mentioned workflows. So part of that is uh, getting the data in as well in, at the start. And we have a new semantic import uh, structure that is using some of this semantic technology we've built up for Wolf Malfa, turning linguistics into, into data. Uh, in order to get data in, in a more efficient way. So here's a typical piece of uh, delimited data. And import can handle this just fine right now. But the new semantic import will do something a little bit extra. It'll do a couple of extra things. One is it'll put it into the data set structure that, that I wanted. And network permitting, because I think this is making some more from alpha calls. It's figured out some things about the data. It's figured out that the Entries in the city column are probably cities, and the entries in the country column are probably countries. And if I had fuller dates, it would have recognized the dates. So if we take a look at, for example, one of these, we have this new thing. I don't know if you can read this. It says entity, city, uh, and then some details. This concept of an entity is a way of saying this isn't just a string with the word Taipei in it. It is an entity of a city. And that allows us to do all kinds of semantic recognition. We can check forms of whether you've typed in an address or an email. Uh, we can find out all kinds of properties because we, he, these are things that we could know about uh, cities that tie into the Wolf Malfa. So we're trying to build a structure so that the, not, the data that you have has the knowledge of Wolf Malfa attached to it. And this is a preliminary step towards the Wolfram data format that we'll be releasing soon, which is an attempt to expose the, the, the ontology and underlying structure of the Wolfram Alpha data. So why is this useful? What practical difference does it make? Well, at the moment it seems a bit abstract, but additional functions will come online over time that will make it less abstract. And here's one that I can take uh, a particular entity like France and I can drill down some of the relationships to, for example, the administrative divisions, the département of, of France. Okay, so we can find related information, but that really starts becoming useful when you start doing things like the geo-visualizations. And this is a big new graphical area for us. is uh, is a completely comprehensive way of showing geo-information. So having generated that list, I can then start attaching information to it. So I've just stuck some random numbers here. And here's a lovely plot of, uh, of whatever this random data was across the different uh, counties of France. And being able to plunder the Wolfram Alpha data makes it easy to, to pull out the information that you need without having to know in great detail that the argument for the region around Paris is called something or other and how to specify that. And because we can tie into Wolfram Alpha data, I can equally uh, reference things that it does know about. So here I'm just generating a plot of the population of those counties. And this works on different levels, so we can do countries. Here is a, a plot of uh, some numbers against uh, four countries across Europe. 
Of course, like all graphics, they're highly customizable, so I can change the color schemes, or in this case, I've thrown in uh, uh, custom textures on each of the uh, countries that I'm plotting. And other primitives that you expect from graphics are supported, like lines and points and circles and polygons, and they can all be overlaid onto graphics. But it's not enough just to be able to put a line, or in this case, an arrow, onto a, onto a, graph, onto a plot, because there's a big difference in the geo world than in the nice planar world, is that the world is round. And so all of these things have to be coordinate and projection aware. So the geographics knows that if I plot, for example, here's, uh, at least when I last got the data of Rita, people attending this conference, it knows that a straight line in the world is not a straight line on a map. It has to curve as it, as it goes around. And if I wanted to plot uh, circles around Frankfurt that are 1,000 kilometer distances from Frankfurt, circles on a map are not circles because they're circles on a sphere. So all of that is taken care of automatically. All I have to do is say, put a geocircle uh, around Frankfurt uh, with a diameter of, of uh, some k number of 1,000 kilometers, and there we go, we've got the picture. And this isn't just about uh, countries and um, and counties, it goes right down to street level as well. So if I had been wearing a, um, a uh, GPS device uh, when I went on a fictional run this morning from this hotel, then this is the route that maybe I would have taken. Perhaps, perhaps tomorrow I'll take this run. Um, but again, all I have to do is tell it I've got points at the GPS positions and that I'm sticking a, a nice Mathematica spiky on the coordinates of the hotel and I want to see it at street level. And there's, there's the graphic. And there's more to be seen on this on Wednesday. OK, so of course, there are all kinds of other kinds of data that you uh, can uh, put into Mathematica. But just to jump back to the, my opening, I said that we deal with things which are symbolic underlying. That means everything works with everything. So things like machine learning work with images just as seamlessly as they do with numbers and text. So here I can ask for a classification based on a whole bunch of photographs, that which are either night and day, and I can build a classifier that can now do recognition from, from pictures, and it's decided logistic regression is the right thing here. And now I can give it some pictures it hasn't seen, and it can figure out that these three are daytime pictures and these three are nighttime. And we can do uh, uh, machine learning on sounds and, uh, and other kinds of data as well. Now, of course, uh, we've been doing a lot in image processing for several uh, years now, and that continues. So there's all kinds of new segmentation and, uh, and region recognition. So there's, for example, uh, here's a, a background detection. Oops, I haven't run the code. This is background removal, and I think this might take a few seconds to, off the internet. I can then, uh, once I've removed backgrounds, it becomes a lot easier to mix images together. So I'm trying to pick a random cloud type here to throw that over the top of. There's a uh, new feature in content recognition, uh, things like barcode recognition, sort of practical uh, elements of building up the language of image processing, much richer color support than it was before, and uh, better support for, for 3D images. So we added 3D images before, and there's actually no new functions, really, in Mathematica in this. What we've done is made all of the functions that work on 2D images now work on 3D images. So, uh, Almost universally now, the kind of transforms and the segmentation and alignment and feature detection that used to work only on 2D now also work on 3D images. So that it's, it's quite an extension for things like medical imaging. And uh, where possible as well, we've uh, built in much more kind of on-the-fly user interfaces to make things easier to do if you're not uh, uh, doing everything by programming. So now 3D images have with them an automatic widget where I can jump in and I can edit the color function and what's transparent and what isn't, or um, adjust things like the clipping planes in real time on this. And the clipping planes now are also uh, against custom normal functions, so I can do diagonal clipping planes if I want and so on. Okay, another new domain for us is uh, computational geometry. Um, again, you can see more of this. There's two talks uh, related to this. Um, and to kind of introduce what I'm talking about, I thought I'd start, start with a high school example that I certainly had to do on pencil and paper. Um, this, is, at its simplest form, is, is what the framework deals with. We can take some geometric region, in this case an infinite line passing through two points, and we can answer the question of how close to that line, what distance is the point 0.45 from that. 
And so I used to have to do this, I guess, by you set some vector that went along and you tried to minimize it, and I can't remember now, it's so long ago. But while school examples are great, and uh, I know some of you are educators, and, this, and school examples uh, may be exactly what you want, of course, we're not interested in making educational software. We want to make real tools for doing real work, which then will find use in education. And so we don't stop at the, at the simple examples. We've got a whole uh, language of primitives, of points and disks and balls and spheres, and, uh, and things like the ability to find the difference and the union between regions. Um, so here is a slightly more complex two-dimensional region, and there's all kinds of properties we can do on those. So we can ask for what's uh, the size of that region, what's the center of gravity of that region, and questions like, is a point within the region? So for example, if I was doing uh, back in the geo world, am I in a, which country am I in is, uh, is now a trivial problem to solve from, from coordinates. Now, and of course, this all works in multiple dimensions as well, not just two and 3D, but uh, in sort of hyperspace as well. Now, most things we do in Mathematica, we do both numerically and symbolically. And you've seen some symbolic answers there, actually. I suppose they're sort of not entirely symbolic. Maybe if this had a, had a symbol in it, that would be entirely symbolic. In the, in the geometry sense, the numeric equivalent really is discrete regions, where instead of describing things in terms of these nice sort of geometrical uh, primitives like circles and spheres, um, we need to break them down into uh, regular chunks. So we've got a complete mesh generation in uh, two and three dimensions to be able to take that shape I pre produced before and make this approximate version that's made out of triangles. And then that allows us to do things that either have horrible or impossible to find closed form regions and also allows to us to do things much faster uh, where, where approximate calculations are concerned. But more importantly, it allows us to deal with the real world because the real world isn't circles and, uh, and polygons usually, it's messy, complex shapes. And, and I can now, once I've got discretized versions, then it's very easy for me to grab in real world shapes like uh, the outline of Italy here and do exactly that same nearest calculation. So if you're in the uh, sea and you're sinking and you need to know which way to sail, here's the nearest point on the Italian coast. <laughs> And all I've done is take the polygon for, for Italy out of the country data and turned it into this uh, mesh version and then, and then done a, uh, a region nearest again. And the rest is just manipulate. And I said everything's uh, not just 2D. Here's exactly the same thing going on with a messy, uh, uh, ugly 3D shape. Uh, in this case, my face. And so here are the nearest points to my face, depending on where you start from. Then obviously, my nose sticks out a long way. It all seems to head there. <laughs> So that's all very nice that we can do geometric computations, but it doesn't end there. Because now that we've got a language to describe all this messy real-world geometry, we can start doing real computation on it. And uh, the first step might be to use these kind of shapes within graphics rather than having to have things on rectangles or mathematically described regions. So here, I was going to refresh this this morning. So this does not represent uh, the temperature across Europe today. Um, this was when I wrote the talk last week, the temperatures across Europe. Not very easy to interpret until you put some kind of... Uh, a region uh, shape around it. So if I plot that function over the region of Germany, now we get to see uh, the temperature map in a way that's uh, interpretable. Or uh, if I wanted to do something uh, a little bit less interpretable, I might do, plot, do a 3D plot of that function over the region and, uh, and have some totally weird weather graphic. So the shape is Germany, but the height is temperature. So let's go back to the region I had before, and we can also do things like uh, solving equations uh, constrained by regions. We can minimize, we'll find the lowest point in the region. Um, I've done that symbolically by accident. Let's get a numerical value for that. So the lowest value constrained by the region is down here. We can find the integral of some function over that region. All of these computations are now just region aware. We're just saying as long as x and y are elements of the region. But the jewel in the crown is, uh, is the work of uh, Oliver, who will be talking about this uh, later is to be able to take real world objects and solve the kind of physical engineering problems that you have on them. And for that, uh, we've always had to drop out of Mathematica and go and find a finite element package. Well, we've built a complete finite element system within Mathematica, and it's all hidden almost invisibly behind ND solve. So I can now just say, I want to solve Laplace's equation over the space shuttle, and here's our answer. No harder really, or barely any harder than just uh, solving an ordinary differential equation over an interval. We just say instead of over an interval, the region is uh, where x, y, and z are elements of that space shuttle graphic that I've just imported. A 
Okay, some, uh, some other domains. Uh, there's uh, new work in time series, which is very integrated in with uh, random processes. So we have a new time series object that uh, makes it just much more convenient to, to work with time series. You'll notice as well, just on the kind of ease of use side, that uh, a lot of, uh, of these things that we don't like to show the answer on in Mathematica, that have always had that little short notation saying there's more here, but we're not showing you. We've got this unified way of representing information here. So the, the little uh, icon I get gives me a spark line of the data, so I can see at a glance roughly what uh, the data looks like. It gives me the time interval that the time series is over, how many data points in there, and there's a little bit more about uh, whether it's been interpolated and so on inside. So there's quite a few functions in Mathematica that will use this, this little uh, indicator um, for their contents, which makes it a little bit easier to work with. So one of the uh, great functions in that is uh, time series model fit. Again, it's a high level of automation that I don't need to know which of the random processes are the best fit. It's figured out that the Saroma process is probably the best one to fit to and found the best fit from that. And from that, in, in only an extra line, I can take the time series data that I had and now make my prediction of how that's going to proceed in the future based on that, that fit. And uh, as I said, it fits in with a whole random uh, processes framework. So I can just now say, also say, let's make a random function out of that prediction, and we'll have uh, 100 different possible outcomes uh, so we can get a sense of the distribution of the outcomes. Uh, another uh, new domain is uh, uh, support, uh, more support for sounds and signal processing. So a lot of that's to do with the workflow of making sure that you can process sounds directly without uh, having to extract data. Um, I'm only going to show one thing out of this uh, just because I tried to write this myself ages ago and, uh, and wasted a lot of time doing it very badly. Uh, if I take the sales data that I showed earlier on from the data set, we can now do things like uh, peak detection um, and uh, subtracting out peaks to analyze baseline trends. And the peak function here, where it is? Find peaks here has a parameter for the sensitivity. So it's ignored these very small peaks here because I've got the sensitivity at a level that says I only want to see big peaks, um, which in this case is kind of easy to do by eye. Okay, another uh, domain that has been uh, growing rapidly in Mathematica is, is, is graph theory. Big improvements here, but again, many of those improvements are by adding no new functions because uh, one big shift is that we now have full support for mixed multigraphs. So that is graphs that have both directed and undirected edges and graphs that have multiple connections between the same nodes. So now for the first time we can solve the classic uh, seven bridges of Konigsberg problem, which is can you walk around the seven bridges going over each one only once? And we can enter that graph in and ask whether it's, a, uh, it's got the appropriate property and find that it cannot be done. But obviously the real challenge is uh, to do this kind of stuff that scales to very large and complex graphs. To support that as well, there are some new functions, uh, most likely uh, a whole collection of new tours and paths. Uh, so I've got here a, a kind of fictional network of um, stations within a uh, supermarket distribution center, and the question is we want to connect them up with conveyor belts. What's the cheapest way we can do it? And there's a cost associated with each edge. And we don't want to connect unnecessarily uh, every point to every point, we just want the minimal cost, and so that's a, um, a, um, a, a minimal spanning tree and here's the, the solution to that. And of course, uh, we've been able to do things like find shortest paths across the network and shortest tours and maximize flow as well for a while. Another new one here, this is a fictional um, uh, streaming media architecture where stuff has to be sent from the source to the client and one question is, uh, is to ask about redundancy. Um, what happens if one of the vertices fails? What are our possible routes? So versus inde independent paths is one of these new pathfinding functions that has found that there are four point routes from this source to this uh, client which have no intermediate vertices in common. Sorry, three paths. One, two, three. And these will work over all of these graphs up to very large scales. And we also, uh, in functionality that we've had for a long time, um, uh, the traveling uh, postman uh, type problem uh, traveling salesman, sorry, uh, problem. We, even where we have functions that work perfectly nicely, we still push forward always with new algorithms. So there's a new implementation of that which uh, is going to be incredibly fast and scale incredibly well and also work over graphs that are not fully connected. So even, even existing functionality that gets revised and improved over time. Okay, let's break away from different domains and talk about developing software um, uh, 
and making applications that you can share with other people rather than just problem solving. So with the announcement of the Wolfram language, we've done some work to improve the language. I'm not going to talk about that at all because uh, um, Tom Wickham Jones is on next, I think, talking about the Wolfram language. But we've made various uh, uh, convenience functions and deeper functional programming so that things that you could do before, you can now just do in a one-liner rather than having to write bits of code. Um, and sometimes there are efficiency improvements out of being able to do it uh, as a, as a built-in command rather than writing it your own way. More evaluation control, the testing framework that uh, is available at the moment through um, Wolfram Workbench is coming into Mathematica. So all kinds of things just to round out the language and make it even faster for writing code in. But the key thing that we, we've wanted to solve sometime and are continuing to make progress on of not just using Mathematica as a prototyping environment is the deployment problem that for a long time, in the very early days particularly, people would write uh, code in Mathematica to solve a problem, and then when they want to share it with other people, they'd take the solution and recode it in C or something and, uh, and send them that. And we've, we've made a lot of progress down that route with things like code generation, um, with the CDF um, um, platform to be able to share things without having to recode. Um, and we're adding more into that, uh, in, into, into deployment. So one different angle on that is, is generating reports. CDFs produce beautiful reports that there's no other technology for that mix the narrative and the interactive computation. But at the moment, you've got a choice between you do them by hand or you write a program using things like cell and notebook objects. And, uh, and one is easy and the other is automatic, but they're not both. So we've bridged that gap with a new report generation uh, capability. And the idea is that you use the easy environment for making a beautiful CDF that is the front end, and you write your CDF uh, the way you would by typing in all the narrative and using keyboard shortcuts for the styling, and then you mark it up with fields that will be filled in later. So here we've got a slot that will be filled in, and here we've got something that will compute, and here's something that will be computed and thrown away. So those are sort of the three main elements, but it's also hierarchical, so it doesn't, isn't just flowing into what you can see. You can create cell groups and, uh, and nest them and so on, but this is the simplest form. And having got that, I can now give it a piece of information by saying I want to apply to that template the information that the author is John McLuhan. And, and it's gone behind my notebook, so if I just bring this forward here, you'll see I've now created a document from the template. So you get all of the ease of authoring of the front end, but now you can call the template with the computation as it's needed. And so that allows you to, to start doing automatic reports at every day that the data changes. You can produce a beautiful CDF with interactive things in it without having to uh, go back and do any extra work once you've set it up, and without having to know all the low-level programming. So, oh, I went to close that. I didn't want to close that. Let's just bring that back. So part of that deployment is now the sharing, which uh, I, can't, I should not have given Conrad the advice of not installing the latest build. So um, I'm hoping that because I've got a week newer version of Mathematica, since some changes were made to the cloud, my deployment will work here. So I've taken that automatically generated report and hopefully pushed it into my cloud. Okay, then I will have words with Jan, who is obviously responsible for why this broke overnight. Um, uh, so probably I should not go into the, let's just assume the others will work. So. So being able to put them into the cloud, if it had worked, uh, would give you instant viewing to the public. With, and the key thing is that there's no plugin. This is a big barrier right now with CDF. The plugin that you can download is, is technically very good, but there are people who simply won't or can't download an executable and install it. And with Cloud Deploy, it's only a browser that you need um, when we've got the thing working uh, to be able to view the CDF, including the interactivity. And it's the same CDF, so if I upload it or download it from the cloud and open it in Mathematica, it will edit. It's not, an, it's not a conversion to something in the cloud. It is the CDF. So another part of deployment is being able to set up things that people can interact with, uh, not in a kind of manipulate way, but in, uh, in more of a kind of web form or API type way. And so we've got frameworks for that as well. So we have this new form function here, and I'll just activate this form. And this is where some of these semantics come in. I can easily put in this that the first field has to be a number between 1 and 99, and the second field has to be an email address. So if I put in some illegal uh, uh, content in here, it can automatically detect that those don't look like the match forms. And this is all part of this semantic framework for recognizing is something a certain entity? Is that an email address? Does it look like an email address? 
And um, let's see if this works any better. Oh, maybe it's because I wasn't signed in. That would be embarrassing. Right, so here's the form that I've now just deployed, and I forget what trivial computation I put into the form, but obviously you would do something real. It was uh, um, take a number and do the factorial of it. So I can put in here the number between uh, 1 and 99 that I asked for, and I have to put in my email because I asked for that. And hit submit, and there's my answer. So we now, obviously, I've, I've done a good job. I would have actually formatted that as a pretty CDF that looked a bit nicer than this wide piece of text. But this process of taking, um, defining a form, taking a program I've written, pushing it into the cloud, and letting other people use it is now a few seconds work. And uh, by marking it public, which I think I forgot to do there, no, I didn't mark. No, I didn't mark it as public. If I had, you would be able to go to that URL now and play with my the tool that I just created. And likewise, we have something for APIs, so I can uh, take something and put out something not for human consumption, but for machine consumption. And this URL now will respond to the parameter x and return um, x plus 3. Now, to make use of that, you need to then make calls from your other system. If this is all about integrating things together. And so one of the things that we've added to that to make it a lot easier is I can take that API call and now generate the appropriate Visual Basic code in order to... Um, uh, to part, paste this into a Visual Basic program, and it will now be able to call out that API without any further work. Of course, in Mathematica, calling external APIs is really easy. I just use URL fetch. So I can now call that external API. So I'm cheating there because that's the test I did this morning. This is the one I just created. And I can call that, and it's done the computation in the cloud, but it's completely seamless behind my program. And... Uh, um, Part of the system integration as well is connecting into other uh, services. So obviously we do things like file and database connectivity for years, but there's a new service framework where I can connect into other kinds of service, like I can attach to my Dropbox account here and find information about my Dropbox files or what, have I, what directories are in my Dropbox uh, setup. I can write things and read things from Dropbox. And there's all kinds of other services. I might have, for example, when my reports run, I might want to get an alert and I might want to do that over Twitter. So, so I'm just now connected to my Twitter account. You can see how popular I am with no followers. <laughs> and if I, um, if I take a picture of you here, I can now tweet that straight to my, so now I have my first tweet out in the cloud and if you go and search on Twitter, you should find that I've just done a live tweet mid-talk about my talk, showing who's listening to me talk. And, oh yes, <laughs> thank you very much. So I should move on quickly then if I only have five minutes. Um, I probably don't have time any then probably to talk about device integration. Some of you may have noticed this sort of odd project that we uh, started, the Connected Devices project, curating the world's devices, and it seems a bit random from our point of view. That hopefully will become clearer as, um, um, as we start rolling out drivers for particular devices. So we now have a unified framework to be able to say, what devices do I have connected to, to, to my computer? In this case, I've got two cameras and some, uh, some demo devices. And I can read and write to those in a totally unified way. And part of that, to make that, uh, if you're going to get into the world of things like robotics and, and the physical world, then integrating in better with System Model 4, which we're about to release, is a key part of that. Um, we've got more control theory and... Conrad's already mentioned being able to then take that code and run it right on the device in a uh, Raspberry Pi or an Intel Edison with these system-on-a-chip type uh, uh, embeddings. Since I'm out of time, I will skip over all of that and just talk finally about ease of use. Um, hopefully, functionality-wise, there's something for everyone, but we try to improve just the, the daily way of working with, with, uh, with Mathematica. So the predictive interface has obviously got lots of new rules in it. But we also have a uh, whole new form of automatic templates, so that if I type something, I get a completion automatically, and once I've got a completion, I can pick from templates without needing to know keystrokes and find them and fill those things in. We've got more inline auto-completions, so if I start typing things that have option values now, like um, plot style um, goes to, I start getting possible option values suggested to me. There's a new plot theme and when I get to plot themes, I can uh, start, I get to see roughly what the theme looks like. Um, things that have strings in them automatically fill in now as well. So if I start typing something like country data, it knows the list of possible completions. Um, likewise, for string arguments for options, it knows what the possible typical 
options on IndieSolver. And it's even system aware of uh, things that are on your system. So if I do something like font family goes to, you see I get things in the actual fonts because it's examined my system to see what fonts I have available and will give me a choice of what font I want things in. And my personal favorite, because I use this all the time, is if I do something like import now, then as I start typing the path, I get path completions automatically within the string. And um, there's also a file browser straight there to search without having to get back to the menus again. You've seen some of these automatic specialist GUIs already with the Plot3D. There are more of those. There's uh, more of this output formatting that I showed earlier, the little summary things. There's a kind of neat um, input synchronization where you may have had this problem um, yourself where you do some computation in, in Mathematica and then you change it, but you don't reevaluate it and they're out of sync. Well, now it goes great to tell you they're out of sync. So you can see that, uh, that this 2 plus 3 does not relate to this answer of 4. It's only when I reevaluate it, it goes back again. And last but not least, as I end, uh, we finally have a complete multi level undo within Mathematica. <laughs> We have uh, John Fultz to thank for, for this. Uh, but as usual, when we do things, we try and do them properly. So there is even detailed control over if I've got to manipulate, does the you can decide whether the slider should be undoable or not. There's control over which variables within dynamic content are undoable, as well as just simply being able to uh, um, go back through the, the content in, um, in a notebook. I don't know what I was editing before. So I'll wrap up there. A thousand new features. Great effort to make sure that all of these things highly integrate across one domain and another, and easier to use than ever with new deployments. I give you Mathematica 10. <laughs>